automatically you didn't have to worry about whether your point has gone off the end or, and so on. So on to the more interesting uh, sandboxing related, related things. We're going to talk about privilege separation. So privilege separation is about using multiple processes in your, in your design. Julian covered the fact that uh, Unix offers a very strong boundary between, between processes, so they're a good, a good primitive, if you like, to use to, uh, to make your application more robust. So you sort of want to be looking at one process per, per privilege level in your application, which sounds complicated, like you might have an explosion of privileges, but uh, typically a lot of good designs can make do with just two processes. We'll see that with VSFTPDs. Um, Obviously, you want to use different users for the, for the two processes, or otherwise the processes can typically just take each other over. Um, each process should run with the minimum privilege it needs. That's the uh, principle of least security, which uh, Julian, no, what was the other principle? <laughs> uh, least, least security, uh, least, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, that one, yeah. And obviously these two processes, uh, the trusted end and the untrusted end, are going to have to communicate with each other. And you want to keep that communication simple, both in, in the sort of messages going back and forth and the way those messages are transmitted. Otherwise, the more complicated that is, the more, the more chances there's going to be a, a buggy interaction between your trusted and your untrusted end. So let, let's look at a, a definite example of VSFTPD. So uh, the motivation for VSFTPD was, um, this was a long time ago, this, it was written, it, I think it started in something like 1999. And at that time, all of the popular FTP servers had a bit of a design, uh, design error, whereby if you logged in as an anonymous user, um, which obviously anyone can do without any authentication, and then there was some form of, of, of bug, say a buffer overflow in the FTP parsing code, al although you were sort of running as an unprivileged user, there was, there was root privilege in the background. So any, any compromise of an anonymous session, and you've totally lost that machine. And that, that's, kind of, that's kind of unfortunate. And every time a new, um, a new class of security vulnerabilities would come out, say, for example, format strings, then you, you'd have these terrible bugs where anonymous FTP servers could get, could get rooted straight away. So that's, that's not such good design, and VSFTP was started just to see if, if something could be done about that. So in the, we're going to look at VSFTPD in the attack service it exposes uh, whilst it's using sandboxing. And the concrete scenario we're going to talk about um, is an FTP server that doesn't expose anonymous accounts, uh, just has password authenticated accounts um, and those, those logins have to be over SSL. Uh, the reason we've thrown SSL into the equation is that it, it's, it's kind of hard to get the FTP protocol wrong before you've logged in because you only have to handle accepting a username and a password and checking if it's right or not. Whereas if you add an SSL, you've got the whole SSL handshake which has got you know, integers and lengths flying back and forth across the network and that's actually a much larger and more risky attack surface. So the goal is to see what we can do what we can do based on our guess that there will be vulnerabilities in SSL libraries that still haven't been discovered. So this is what things look like um, in terms of processes when you are not yet authenticated to VSFTPD. You've got two processes represented by the shapes. That, um, on, on the right is the untrusted process running as nobody, not not the real nobody, but sort of the concept of nobody, some, some user ID that doesn't own anything too sensitive. Um, and in there happens all the risky things, so the FTP parsing and, and mainly the SSL handshake. And once this untrusted end has, has got it, what it thinks is a proposed username and password, it sort of sends them to the trusted end running as root, um, which has the authority, if that username and password proves to be correct, to sort of uh, kill this process on the right and, and spawn the new process running as the correct user for that, for that session. Um, the point here being that the stuff running as root on the left is as small as possible and it has a very minimal interface to the untrusted side. Or all it does is accept the username and password and, and checks them. So let's say I provide a valid username and password and I get a session now running as Chris. Um, slightly more trusted, hence the change in color. But we still, Chris may still not have permission to run programs on that machine. He may still be a user that just has permission to download and upload some files. Um, so we've got all of the untrusted stuff still going on in, in a separate process. So the expanded FTP protocol parsing, uh, more SSL handshakes for the data connections, and, and so on. And all of the things it may need to do that are slightly privileged, it again asks uh, a new process, privileged process, uh, for, the, for those facilities. So one example here is um, 
the FTP protocol, if you're following it properly, actually requires that connections coming out from the server originate uh, on port 20, and setting up a socket that has, has that low port on it is a privileged operation. Um, but you don't need root uh, to do that operation. You just need a single capability. So that's why we can uh, run this, this new uh, privileged process over here with very little privilege, just sort of the figurative nobody again, but just with a little bit more privilege, which is the single capability to hand out these sockets. So we need to talk about uh, trust relationships between, the, between these multiple processes. So we've sort of almost covered this a bit, but if you have a higher privileged process, it's got to really distrust anything, any interaction with the lower privileged process. Um, let me go back to uh, the unauthenticated slide. A really bad design here would be is if, if this root process um, took a message from the untrusted end that said, oh, yeah, Chris is here. He, he gave me his password, and, and it, was, it was the right one, honest. And I sort of trusted that as the root process and I handed out a session to Chris. That would obviously be, be very bad because then a compromised process on the right here could just pretend it was whoever it wanted. So that... The distrust here is that the, the password validation absolutely happens in this process on the left. So you've got to handle bad messages from the child. Um, in terms of transmitting a, a user and a password, that's a couple of strings. So you're looking at some serialization going on. Uh, when you deserialize that message, uh, you've got to be very careful not to mess up by, for example, uh, if there are some integers in that deserialization protocol. If you, have classic integer overflows or signedness issues and so on, uh, then you could take over the, the trusted end via a bad message. Uh, so you have to be uh, careful there. Or you can have messages that are sort of not garbled, but they're just asking for something that you shouldn't be able to ask for. So one example would be, I just said, if, if the untrusted process said, oh, well, give me a session as Chris, whereas actually what it needs to do is prove that it, it knows the password for Chris. So let, let's look at the attack surface of what a compromised process on, on Unix in general can do. Um, this represents a non-root process. Uh, otherwise, obviously, you could do anything. Um, uh, so an unprivileged user, a compromised uh, process. So what the attacker will typically do is elevate their sort of now local session uh, to, to some, a root session via, via some privilege escalation method. So if you like a two-bug, two-phase approach to get full control over the machine. And the ways they're going to look at doing that are, if they've got full file system access, they're going to be very interested in, in things like any set UID binaries you've got lying around, because those are a, a common path for escalation. Um, any local Unix file system sockets listening uh, also may be interesting to send them bad messages. Um, maybe we can attach some other processes with, our, with the same user as us and uh, take those over. We can attack the kernel API, if there are any bugs in the kernel. We could be in trouble. Um, we're running arbitrary code here, so we can try and denial of service the machine via resource exhaustion. Not very interesting. We can kill processes, send signals around. Um, hack the internal network is a very interesting one. So maybe you've got an SSH daemon listening only on the local network. Um, now you've, you've compromised the machine um, over the internet. Now you can connect to local host sockets or, or, or uh, any other networking services that may have vulnerabilities in them uh, in the DMZ behind the firewall. So VSFDPD has always um, had some defenses here. It's always had a Chirut jail, uh, one method of sandboxing that Julian covered. And that takes out the file system access re uh, second escalation component, which is, which is pretty huge. Um, we're assuming that the privileged channel uh, is very careful, and we've been, we've been careful enough there, so that's not a significant avenue of attack. Um, also, because of the way the, the uh, unprivileged process is set up, it's uh, left with, in, in a non-dumpable state. Julian briefly covered that concept. It means that two processes, even though they have the same user ID, cannot uh, trace each other and uh, take each other over. But as you can see, there's still, even though we've gone to a reasonable effort to sandbox something, there's, there's still a few avenues of attack. So with the VSFTPD, 2.2 in the default configuration, um, some of these new Linux kernel sandboxing facilities have been integrated for kernels uh, that support them, and the attack surface has shrunk nicely. So one of the big ones we mentioned, like uh, attacking the internal network. Well, as Julian mentioned, uh, modern kernels have the ability to separate out 
um, a process into a new network namespace. And what that means is when you say connect to localhost, you, it's just not a registered network and you get an error. Um, so that's a very useful reduction in attack surface. Um, a lot of systems, if you log into them, seem to have lying around a bunch of world readable, writable, shared memory segments. That's unfortunate. Who knows who owns those? And uh, what you can do by, by messing with those. So we also use the new uh, IPC namespace to take that off the attack surface. That's, that. That's the bottom green cross there. Um, I added some R limits. Uh, I don't, I'm not particularly interested ever in denial of service attacks, but um, add some R limits. You can't do a, a trivial uh, fork bomb, for example. Um, what else? Oh yeah, you can't you can't send kill signals to uh, other FTP processes anymore because you're in the new process ID namespace. So, although the processes are sort of there on the machine that you could kill because you have the same user ID, you just can't see them. You just can't look them up by by process ID. They're simply not there. Um, what remains is uh, it's quite a large attack surface. Is attacking the kernel API. We'll have a well. We'll discuss that in some detail on some of the more advanced sandboxes that Julian is going to cover later. So. We'll just cover some more subtle trust examples. It's not always obvious when a trusted, when your trusted uh, end of the channel, if you like, is, is interacting with, with something that's untrusted. Um, some examples from the Chromium open source project that's quite interesting. Uh, the Chromium browser actually has a sandboxed renderer processes so that an evil website who's, who's got a bug in, in your HTML parsing or, or image parsing and so on is actually uh, contained within a sandbox. Um, and that sandbox has no write access or no read access to the file system. Um, so there's sort of a conflict there. What about websites that legitimately need to upload and download files to and from the user? So the way this works is uh, upon a request to upload or download a file, the privileged browser kernel brings up a file dialog and asks the user to select a file. And only a file that a user selects in the upload file dialog is is sort of registered then as a, as a known file that the, that the renderer can access. So that, that, solves, uh, that solves the problem there by making the user choose to send a file to, to a website. Um, we had an interesting bug that we found and fixed internally in Chromium. Um, if you like a garbled message attack from one of the slides covered earlier, whereby to, since the renderer is a sandbox, if they want to, make, uh, if they want to play some audio, that's sort of a privileged operation that has to be sent off to the browser kernel. And there was a problem there where if you just sort of lied about how many channels and, and how, what the bit rate was of the sample you wanted to play, you could cause a classic integer overflow. So that's been addressed. Um, more subtly, what happens if a renderer crashes? The, the privileged side of the browser wants to sort of register that condition as interesting and get a stack trace out and, you know, so that we can work out what happened and fixed it. Um, so the interesting state there is they say the attacker has compromised the renderer and is executing arbitrary code in the renderer. They're actually at liberty to set up the, the address space for that process however they want and then sort of fake a crash, if you like, so that when the, when the privilege end attaches to you to dig out a stack trace, you've got a really weird, um, really weird setup in terms of how your memory looks. And, and so you can try and exploit the, the parser of the virtual address space or the, or the, uh, or the stack, if you like. Um, did look at that, didn't find anything. If you find something, drop me a mail. Um, with VSFTP, I was putting this presentation together, I actually found a, a very minor bug that it does illustrate nicely the subtleties of trust. Um, let's say you've tried to log in and the password is incorrect. So typically, you, will, you might delay a couple of seconds. I mean, I'm, I'm not a great fan of that. I think if your password's weak, you, you've got it coming. But VSFTPD does this now. Um, so the question is, Someone's made a failed login attempt, bad password. Who does the sleep? Is it the untrusted side or the trusted side? Well, currently it turns out the sleep is done in the untrusted side of VSFTPD, which means that a, a compromised uh, FTP process could essentially attempt to brute force a password without any rate limiting. So that's a more, more subtle example of, of trust relationships there. And I will fix that, even though it's almost not worth fixing. Finally. Um, it's worth talking about uh, patching. Um, I'm just going to re-emphasize in a different way one of Julian's opening points, which was um, about defending yourself against mistakes in software. Because any large piece of software is going to have bugs. And a, a browser certainly counts as a large piece of software. All of them are huge pieces of code, millions of lines, most of which are security sensitive or critical. 
So you're going to have bugs, and some subset of those bugs is going to be security bugs. So 